Okay, well, thanks very much to the organizers for inviting me to this uh, beautiful location. Um, I want to talk about some work I've been doing over the last two years or so together with Rajesh Kopakuma. And um, I'll, I'll mainly try to describe to you sort of the more recent insights uh, that, have, uh, that are contained in this paper. So let me first of you sort of try to put you in the, in the right frame of mind of uh, where this is taking place. So I think of this problem as coming from the ADS-CFT correspondence, and I'm sure most of you are aware of what the ADS-CFT correspondence roughly does. It, relates, it gives a relation between string theory and some ADS background to a, a conformal field theory. And what's important in this is that the relation between the parameters of the two theories are, is as follows. The, the radius of the ADS space in terms of Planck units to some power is proportional to n, the rank of the gauge group. Uh, whereas the radius in string units is to some power is uh, equal to the tooth parameter of the, uh, of the uh, dual gauge theory and the string coupling constant and the Young-Mills coupling constant are directly related to one another. So in, in, in most incarnations of uh, this duality, in, in most places where this has sort of been usefully applied, what one has done is one has looked at a regime where n is large so this you want to do because you see otherwise quantum gravity effects will become strong and quantum gravity ultimately is what we want to understand. So ultimately we want to understand this at finite n, but for the moment we rather not think about quantum gravity because we have very little to say about it. So what people have mostly done is looked at a regime where the gravity side of things are under control. So you take R large relative to the Planck scale to switch off quantum gravity and you take R large relative to the string scale to switch up all the stringy effects. And then you have basically a point particle supergravity description on one side. And you obviously want the string coupling constants to be small so that you don't have to worry about string effects. And what this means is you end up with a large N gauge theory. That's fine. But it's necessarily at large tooth coupling. Now, it depends on your point of view whether you think this is a good thing or a bad thing. If you are an inherent optimist, you think it's a good thing. Because what it means, it gives you access to pieces of gauge theory you don't have otherwise access to by relating it in terms to a supergravity description you have under control. And this is really where much of this sort of excitement about the ADS-CFT correspondence has gone, using gravitational description to get access into strongly coupled gauge theories that are otherwise inaccessible. Now, on the other hand, if you are somewhat more of a skeptic, you feel a little bit uneasy about this. In particular, if you start applying it to context where you're not in n equals to four super young mills and you don't have integrability and supersymmetry and all the rest of it at your disposal and you can't directly derive it from string theory, which is what most of these contexts of the QCD or, 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 or quark gluon plasma applications have been at. And then you, you may be worried whether this correspondence will just continue to work like that and whether the intuition you get from from the, uh, any, from the very supersymmetric, et cetera, case is reliable. So you would want to understand the, the sort of underlying principles behind this duality rather than just use it as a black box that tells you something about you, which you didn't know anything in terms of something you can calculate, but you have to believe that the correspondent works the way you, it works. So if you want to understand the correspondence and maybe understand to which degrees it relies on integrability or supersymmetry or whatever, then maybe you should look at a slightly different corner of this correspondence. So what I propose to do is that we should look at this correspondence in the, in the limit where the tooth coupling constant is small. I still want to be at large n because I still don't know how to do quantum gravity. But what the proposal is that one should look at it from the point of view of a small tooth coupling. And what this means is that the radius is going to be small relative to the string scale, or put differently, the string scale is going to be very, very large, or put differently, the strings are very, very floppy. They, 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 they are very, have a small tension and they sort of explore all of the geometry and they're very, very far away from being a point particle. It's really the opposite limit to being a point particle. Now, you, you may say that this is, a, this is a great idea, but it's also a totally hopeless idea because now you know what you have to do here, but you have no idea what you have to do on the other side, because on the other side you are now in the deeply stringy regime and nobody knows how to solve string theory in ADS-5. Now the idea is that if you go to this sort of extreme limit, then things become better again. There is another regime in which you have a good description, not directly in terms of string theory, 
but in terms of one of these Vasiliev higher spin theories. So the idea is that in the tensionless limit, all the sort of wretched trajectories, all the alpha prime corrections come down and become massless. And as a consequence, the effective description of this, of this theory will have infinite many massless higher spin gauge fields. And you should maybe just look at this sort of the requirements that come from the fact that you have all of these very many or infinitely many massless higher spin fields. And the gauge, the condition that they are gauge invariant, the whole theory gives you very strong constraints. And you could hope that you can sort of characterize and solve this theory based from that point of view rather than attempting to describe it honestly as a string theory. So this is the sort of idea that this in some sense is the maximally unbroken phase of string theory. And sort of the big idea is to try to understand the idea CFT correspondence starting at that point um, in, in, in the moduli space where, where you describe not directly string theory, but this sort of very maximally sub symmetric uh, uh, subsector of it, which is then characterized in terms of a Vasily of higher spin theory. Now, this idea has sort of been pursued by other people, in particular by, by Augusto. And uh, the, I'm at this moment in time not directly trying to embed what I'm going to do in string theory, but I think we are at a point where we're very close to reaching that. I mean, certainly in the 4D, 3D case, there are some ideas, and we also have some ideas how it may work in the lower dimensional case. Now, obviously here I've sort of made a little loop, a little jump in my argument by assuming that all the string excitations become massless. Now, this is justified to a certain extent from the fact that the same obviously happens in the dual field theory. If you're really in a free theory, then you also have very many conserved and higher spin currents. And then by the usual ADS dictionary, that should tell you that there, is a, there are higher spin uh, gauge fields in ADS. So, so the fact that these ratchet trajectories come down, which is really a, 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 an intuition you have from flat space string theory, is sort of also justified by the fact that from the dual field theory point of view, you're expecting all of these symmetries. And therefore, this is certainly a picture that fits together. So this is sort of the, the, the grand vision. Now this grand vision has been filled with a, with a concrete idea already some years ago. Namely, there is this proposal of Klebanov and Polyakov and Seskin and Sandel that there is a, a concrete incarnation of this idea. Namely, there's a higher spin theory in ADS4 not just a higher spin theory, one of the Vasiliev higher spin theories, and a very precise one, being related to the ON three-dimensional vector model in the larger and limit. There are different versions of this, which uh, depending on whether you look at the bosons or the fermions and the free or the interacting fixed points, and there are a handful or rather four parity-preserving, well, there are two parity-preserving higher spin theories on ADS4, but then you can choose some boundary conditions, so there's a, there's a sort of a bit of a uh, a fourfold match between these two uh, theories. And what has really sort of uh, triggered some of the excitement in the field uh, was this beautiful work of Guillaume Bianyin, who took this up and tried to subject it to some inter interesting tests. And the interesting tests they subjected it to was to calculate the three point functions of the higher spin fields on ADS4 using the Vasilia formalism. And they managed to match it to the three point functions you calculate directly in the ON vector model to leading order in 1 over N. And that's sort of a, a dynamical test of this correspondence. And I think it sort of persuaded many people that something interesting is happening there. I should say that this has sparked a lot of uh, recent activities. So by now, there have been also proposals for how to generalize this away from this sort of original framework to uh, chern simons theories. And these chern simons theories also suggest maybe a way in which this could sit inside string theory. And I think this is a very exciting uh, recent development. Now, I'm going to talk about something else. I'm going to talk about the lower dimensional version of the same duality. Namely, what we're going to do is we're going to look at ADS3 rather than ADS4. And correspondingly, we're going to look at the two-dimensional CFT being dual to it. Now, I like this because I love two-dimensional CFTs. But um, it's, uh, I think it's uh, interesting because uh, two-dimensional CFTs are things you understand very well. And uh, you understand much of their structure. So that gives you many, many tools to sort of constrain and, uh, and analyze this duality. And also, this is sort of the fact that this is sort of in some sense simpler. It's also in some sense more complicated, but in some sense simpler. It's also mirrored by the fact that this is in some sense simpler. There is a, the higher spin theories in three dimensions have a sort of a very neat description in terms of a chern simons theory. And that allows you to sort of analyze them more conveniently than the higher dimensional versions of the higher spin theories. Now, in, in a posteriori, I should say that there was this uh, recent work of Maldesina and Jiboyedov, 
who noted, well, they sort of studied it from the trying to con constrain uh, uh, conformal field theories with uh, higher spin symmetries. And what they showed is that if you're in a three-dimensional conformal field theory and you have an unbroken higher spin symmetry and a finite number degree of freedom, then the theory is necessarily free, i.e. the correlation functions agree with the correlation functions of a free theory. Now, this is not true in two dimensions. So in this sense, the two-dimensional example is more complicated. It's maybe more interesting because there's more structure there because they're certainly interacting two-dimensional conformal field theories with higher spin that are interacting and not free. So, so, so this no-go theorem, as they also point out, doesn't apply to two dimensions. In two dimensions, there's more structure, or if you wish, less structure. I mean, it means that the higher spin constraint isn't quite as terribly strong as in higher dimensions, and therefore you have a little bit more to play with than just uh, free theories. On the other hand, obviously, in larger and limit, this uh, relies on finite demand degrees of freedom. So if you take n to infinity, you can still have very many interesting um, examples. And indeed, even the, 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 the weakly broken form of this higher spin symmetry is useful in order to constrain correlation functions. OK, so the, the concrete proposal we have, uh, we have uh, made uh, about uh, two years ago is that the, uh, a specific higher spin theory on ADS3 together with a complex scalar field of a specific mass is due to the larger limit of a family of two-dimensional conformal field theories. These are WNK minimal models, and I'll explain to you what they are um, later on. So you have to take a limit in which you take N and K large while keeping some ratio fixed. And this parameter that you keep fixed, which you can think of as some sort of tooth coupling parameter, is to be identified with a parameter that appears in the definition of the higher spin theory in ADS3. As you will see, this is a Chan Simons theory based on a specific Lie algebra, and the Lie algebra depends on this parameter lambda. And then you have to add a scalar whose mass is also determined in terms of this parameter lambda. Now, I should say that in the original version of the conjecture, there were two scalars, but as I'll try to explain below, we now believe that one of these scalars you should really think of as being a non-perturbative state. So there's really only one perturbative scalar, but that will hopefully become clearer later on. And that re resolves also some puzzles the original proposal had regarding the structure, the larger and behavior of the structure of the correlation functions. So in the rest of the talk, what I want to do is I want to explain to you the proposal in more detail. In particular, I want to explain to you how you describe higher spin theories in three dimensions. Then I want to explain to you what these 2D CFTs are how you match the symmetries. That's actually a very uh, intriguing way this works. So this is not at all trivial, but in my opinion, quite neat. And then I'll explain to you how the spectrum matches, and then I'll s finish with some conclusions. So as I was saying, in three dimensions, the higher spin theory is simpler. And part of the reason is that you can describe it in terms of a chern simons theory. And that's in some sense familiar to you. Because you see, you know that pure gravity in three dimensions is a chern simons theory based on SL2R. That's sort of familiar from the, from the 80s. And that may make you believe that what you have to do in order to describe a higher spin theory in ADS3, you should replace SL2R by a Lie algebra. That's sort of a, a big bigger, and it's going to accommodate the, the higher spin field. So the proposal is that you replace SL2R by an algebra, which I call HS lambda. And I'll say you a little bit more about it on the next slide. <coughs> And this is an algebra that will, for generic values of lambda, will give you a higher spin theory with a gauge field for each spin, a gauge field of spin 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on, for each massless spin. Now, HS lambda is an infinite dimensional Lie algebra, and you probably haven't heard of it, but you should have heard of it, because it's a, it's a very natural Lie algebra. So you see, the way you should think about it is that it's really SL lambda. So what do I mean by this is, well, if you've ever asked yourself, what is SLn? If n is not an integer, then the answer is hs lambda. Why is that so? Because hs lambda has the property that if you pick lambda to be an integer, the algebra, which is infinite dimensional, acquires a gigantic ideal. Then you can quotient out by this ideal. You end up with a finite dimensional Lie algebra. And the finite dimensional Lie algebra is isomorphic to sln. So it's in some sense sort of the analytic continuation of sln to non-integer values of n. That's what this algebra is that underlies the higher spin theory. There's a very explicit description of it in terms of a quotient of a universal enveloping algebra based on SL2. But unfortunately, I don't have time to explain that. But the ex it's not that this is an, an abstract beast. It's a beast. It's a beast. But all the commutation relations are explicitly known. They're a closed formula for all the ex commutation relations. They're just not 
that simple. I mean, but they're explicit. And you can put them on a computer, and there's no problem with understanding this algebra. You can also do it by hand. There's no problem. So, so this is uh, the ADS3 uh, higher spin theory, and then we do what we've been told how to do. We, we just follow the asymptotic symmetry analysis of Brown and NO. That's the sort of precursor of ADS CFT. And what we do is we determine the asymptotic symmetry algebra corresponding to this higher spin theory in ADS3. And what you find is that the asymptotic symmetry algebra is an algebra I've just given a name. I call it W infinity of lambda algebra, and some Poisson algebra, if you wish, um, that you calculate exactly like Brown and NO did uh, for the case of pure gravity. So in pure gravity, this is just very sorrow. And when you do it here, you get this uh, infinite algebra, which is, uh, was previously constructed by Figueroa Farrell as a Poisson algebra. It's generated by one virus or a primary for each spin, two, three, and so on. And this is really where the subject started with the work of Henno and Ray and Campioglioni et al. I mean, Andrea is here in the audience. Um, they did this for various values of lambda, and then uh, together with Tom Hartman, we generalized it to the arbitrary, to general case and derived the structure of this W infinity of lambda algebra. So that's sort of the, the first step of what you do. You start with this high spin theory in ADS3, and you calculate the asymptotic symmetry algebra, and then by the usual sort of what uh, the doctrine we've been told, that should mean that dual CFT should be a conformal field theory that will have this as its symmetry, as its chiral algebra. And then the basic idea is that this algebra is the larger limit of this minimal model algebra. So this sounds sort of plausible on a certain level because this has infinitely many spins, and that has infinitely many spins. But uh, obviously, there's much more to this than, than just sort of this uh, coarse grain statement. So let's, let me explain to you how this goes. But before I do that, let me remind you what these minimal models are. So the minimal models you can think of as being cosets. Um, there are the SUN level K plus SUN level 1 over SUN level K plus 1 cosets. And if you don't like that, then what you should think about is if you put n equals to 2, then that is just the normal virus or a minimal model. So n equals to 2 and k equals to 1 is the icing model. n equals to 2, k equals to 2 is the tricritical icing model, and so on. And then when you put n a bit larger, then you get things that still have names, like the three-state pots model. And these are sort of the, the higher spin generalization of the minimal models. But these are as good rational conformal field theories as there are. I mean, if you... If you you can find everything you want to know about them in the yellow book. I mean, there is, uh, there's, there's, everything is known about them. You know the fusion rules, you know the S matrix, you know the primaries, you know the characters, you know. It's just a little bit more complicated, but everything is totally explicit. And the way you should think about it is that these are the higher spin analogs of the Virasoro minimal models. That's what these theories are. Now, as I was saying that uh, both of them are sort of this W infinity algebra that comes out of the, uh, the asymptotic symmetry analysis and this limit of these are sort of both roughly speaking in the same ballpark. But if you look a little bit closer at them, they actually look quite different. And they look quite different for a totally obvious reason. Because you see, this is a Poisson algebra. So it is given by Poisson brackets. And you can obviously try to quantize it and to make it into commutators by replacing Poisson brackets by I times commutator. But there is a problem because this is a nonlinear algebra and there's no immediate way in which you can do it. Whereas this is just an algebra of uh, commutators. Unfortunately, only the first uh, three elements of which are explicitly known. So you don't know that much about this either. So it's a little bit hard to understand whether this is really the same or not. Now, what we've realized recently that you can actually prove that they are the same by looking very carefully how you can make sense of the quantum version of this algebra. So let me explain that to you. So, the, so what, what, what are the complications? Well, the first complication comes from the fact, as I've just said, that it's a Poisson algebra. It's a totally consistent Poisson algebra. It satisfies the Jacobi identity and everything, but as a Poisson algebra. And that means normal order terms that you don't matter in which order you write them. But when you try to turn them into commutators by replacing Poisson bracket blindly by commutators, you will get terms that are nonlinear in L. There, there's, a, there's a bilinear in L. And when you just sort of blindly do that, what you will find is that it will not, this algebra doesn't satisfy the Jacobi identity. Because of the nonlinear terms when you do the multiple commutators, it matters in which order these L stands. But what you find is that if you impose the Jacobi identities, you can work out how you have to correct the algebra so that it works. So what you have to do is you have to replace this by a certain normal ordered product of the Ls. 
Okay, that's what you would have expected anyway. That's sort of, a, I mean, you have to do that. You have to sort of normal order this term. But the other funny thing you have to do, you have to replace this C by C plus 22 over 5 so that the Jacobi identities of the lowest order terms are satisfied. And there isn't any choice. I mean, this 22 over 5 is not uh, because it was the 22nd of July or the 22nd of May, maybe, and I felt it should be 22 over 5. This comes out of solving the Jacobi identities. There isn't any choice. It is 22 over 5. Now, this is obviously for the first such nonlinear terms, and this algebra is infinitely many such. So you have to repeat this argument for all of these commutators, and we admittedly haven't quite done it, but we've done it for the first 20 or so. I mean, we have normal ordered more terms than I would have wanted to normal order, and we've worked out these coefficients for more of them than I would have liked, but it, it works fine. There doesn't seem to be a problem here. So this is step number one. You have to sort of make sense of sort of the normal ordering business. Now then the second steps are the, are the structure constants. You see, in the simplest case, writing out this uh, OPE in a sort of this commutator in OPE form, what this means is that the OPE of W3 with W3 contains the identity, this stress energy tensor, this normal ordered product already with the correct coefficient, and some spin four field. Now, obviously, you can choose the coefficient in front of this term, anything you like, because you can, you can relabel W3 by 2 times W3 or 27 times W3. So this coefficient, you can choose whatever you like. And this coefficient, you can choose to be whatever you like, because you can rescale W4 in such a way that you have a 4 here. But once you've done that, then you've rescaled W3 and W4, and then in the OPE of W3, W4 with W3, this coefficient has a meaning. There isn't a, you can't rescale it away anymore. So this coefficient has a meaning, and if you work it out from the classical analysis, you find this answer. That's what the algebra that Tom and I determined gives you. They all seem to happen for negative values of C. Yes, I, 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 don't know, I don't know what it means. I mean, they're sort of non-unitary inherently, but I don't quite know what this means. But this is, I think this is like for Wesselmino written models. I mean, if you write down the sugar of our expression, there's a K plus dual Coxter number, and if you choose K to be minus the dual Coxter number, there's a singularity, and it means that I think your spectrum somehow collapses, and I suspect something similar will happen here, but I don't... Ha I mean, it, actually, it's probably a good question because in the case of the affine algebras, that leads to all of these D modules, which the mathematicians love. And this comes from working at negative critical level. There, they, they are, there are interesting mathematical aspects that happen, so maybe something interesting is happening, but that's sort of a higher order uh, level problem. Anyway, so, so this coefficient has a specific uh, value as a function of lambda. And, but you see, I've put the 1 over C there because I know that I will have to correct things by corrections in 1 over C. That's what I learned from looking at the coefficient in front of the commutators. Now, there's a trick to determine the exact value, which is, you see, you know that HS lambda reduces for lambda equal to n to SLn, and therefore you know that W infinity of lambda at lambda equal to n should become Wn, but you know the representation theory of Wn, and therefore, you, you, you can work out what this coefficient has to be in order to be compatible with the known representation theory of Wn level k because you know the minimal model description. You know all the primaries and all the conformal dimensions and all the rest of it. And if you do that, you find that that's the answer. Now, this answer is, I think, only unique if I assume that it's a rational function in C, but I think that's uh, very plausibly so. I mean, I think there are, if you wish, uh, really formally, there are probably some ambiguities, but these are like the CDD ambiguities in, in integrable theories where, where, you, where you sort of operate by some sort of similar uh, uh, procedure. But uh, we have, uh, I mean, everything we know fits perfectly with this answer. Actually, uh, Ralph Blumenhagen and, 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 and people around him and Hornfeck had sort of done this calculation in some incarnation before, and they'd actually worked out also some of these higher constants, and, and these are the explicit formula they obtain. And this, if you look, they're complicated functions of C and lambda. So this looks like a, like a bit of a mess. But what I realized together with uh, Rajesh is that there are actually only functions of gamma and C, where gamma is the structure constant C433 squared. You see, it's not, you see, this is this, uh, this is this structure constant. This is a specific function of C and lambda. And what you realize, if you stare at it, that these sort of are more complicated functions. 
you can write as only being functions of C and gamma, not directly of lambda and gamma. I mean, it's, uh, these are true identities. You can just plug them in and check. But you see what this means, or what this suggests to you, is that all of these structure constants, this is what you would get if these structure constants were determined by the Jacobi identities recursively. Because you see, if you calculate Jacobi identities, you're going to get equations that only involve structure constants of the commutators you already know. And the structure constants of the commutators you know are C and the one structure constant that you couldn't scale away, which is gamma. So the first non-trivial Jacobi identity should give you this, the new structure constants as a function of gamma and C. And if you succeeded in doing that, then the next one should be a function of all the previous ones, i.e. a function of gamma and C. So the fact that all of them look like functions of gamma and C strongly suggests that this means that all of these structure constants are just recursively fixed by Jacobi identities. And together with two students in a postdoc, we've actually checked this. So all of them are determined by Jacobi identities. And we've checked another 20 more or so. And they're all determined by Jacobi identities recursively in terms of gamma and C. So you see what this means is what this suggests. If you believe that this will, again, we haven't done it for all of them. But if you believe it continues forever, what this means is that your algebra really depends on gamma and C, because everything that appears anywhere in your commutation relations is a function of gamma and C. So, so this is what we then propose, that the algebra is actually only parameterized by gamma and C, and it's gamma rather than lambda. It's a very specific combination of, 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 of lambda that appears, and the gamma is this specific uh, function of lambda and C. So, so what, the, what this points to is that the algebra is not really an algebra as a function of lambda, but it's an algebra as a function of gamma and C. And if you look at this equation, you see this equation, if you fix gamma and C, then it f defines for you a cubic equation in lambda. You just multiply it, the denominator, bring it to the other side, and then you have here a cubic polynomial in lambda, and here a cubic polynomial in lambda, so you get a cubic polynomial in lambda with coefficients that are functions of gamma and C. And therefore, for a given gamma, there are three values of lambda that describe I mean, for a given value of gamma and C, there are three values of lambda that solve this equation. And therefore, for every C, there are three values of lambda that give rise to the same algebra. Because in the algebra, in the commutation relations of the algebra, only gamma and C appear. So if, the, if you have the same value of gamma and C, you have the same algebra. So there are three values of lambda that give you the same gamma and C, i.e. the same algebra. And that's sort of proven effectively, you see, by just solving this equation. Now, when you take this equation and you plug in for lambda 1 a positive integer, as you would expect for Wn, and you plug in for C the central charge of an nk minimal model, then what you realize is that the other values are just n over n plus k and minus n over n plus k plus 1. I mean, this is not, I mean, we didn't engineer this. I mean, we didn't, I mean, this formula you can't engineer in such a way that it'll work. So we, we took this formula and we solved it, and what you find is that these are the two solutions. So you see what this means is that the minimal model Wn algebra at the value of the cent correct value of the central charge is equivalent to the W infinity of lambda algebra at the value for lambda being n over n plus k or at the value being minus n over n plus k plus 1. But you see, this is the asymptotic symmetry algebra of the higher spin theory. This is where we started from. Then we started with W infinity of lambda and making it consistently quantum. And this is the algebra of the minimal models. And what this proves is that they're really the same algebra at these values of the central charge. They're honestly the same W algebra because all their commutation relations are exactly the same, because all the coefficients are exactly the same. So all the coefficients are a function of gamma and C. And for these combinations, you get exactly the same value of gamma. So this is tr what's nice about this is that this is true even at finite n and k, not just in the Tuft limit. So this gives you an an, an honest equivalence between two very different W algebras, or seemingly different W algebras. I should say that this uh, generalizes some previous uh, level rank uh, dualities. Now, what's also sort of quite suggested is so this W infinity algebra is nonlinear. So if you, if you remember, there was this term, and there's, there's this nonlinear term here with this funny coefficient that I pointed out before. And this nonlinear term is bilinear in the Ls. Now, if you ask about what's, how does the, higher, the original higher spin algebra sit inside this, then the higher spin algebra you get by restricting the mode numbers for the case of W3 to lie between minus 2 and plus 2. So if you look at the, and the generators for L to sit between minus 1 and 1, that's sort of, 
that will generate you systematically this higher spin algebra. So if you look at the commutator of this, then you see it produces for you the term lambda 4 with some coefficient. And lambda 4 is a bilinear sum over all L's. And therefore, it will also involve L's that do not sit between 0, 1, 1 or minus 1. So as a consequence, this algebra does not contain the original higher spin algebra at finite C, where this term is there. But only when you take C to infinity, you can drop this term. And then you recover the original higher spin algebra. So this, this W infinity algebra does not contain HS lambda as a subalgebra at finite C. And that, I, we believe, is the analog of the maldezina Zibojedov argument, that the higher spin symmetry is broken at finite degrees of freedom, which in two dimensions mean finite central charge. But the nonlinear, in what's unusual in two dimensions is that the nonlinear deformation of this algebra remains a true symmetry, whereas in higher dimension there is no room for these nonlinear deformations, and therefore the higher spin symmetry will be broken. I should also mention that actually this algebra is linear for lambda equal to 1 by a suitable field redefinition, and that ties together with the fact that lambda equal to 1 is a free theory, so again, that's what you would expect based on Maldazina, Zhiboyedov, where they tell you that it's either broken or free. Okay, so what, what these arguments uh, hopefully have convinced you of is that if I look at the higher spin theory in ADS3, which is this Chern Simons theory based on this uh, HS lambda, I pick lambda to be n over n plus k for any value of n and k, then the quantum algebra of this is the same as the minimal model algebra W, n, and k, and therefore I should expect this, the quantum theory of this, to be dual to this two dimensional CFT. And if I want to connect it to, a, to the sort of semi-classical limit, then I should take the central charge to infinity, and that would correspond to taking the Tuft limit of this correspondence. But the correspondence, you would believe, is uh, already true at finite n and k, because there is only one way of making sense of the quantum algebra of this at finite n and k, and that's the algebra I wrote down. Now, this is sort of telling you that the symmetries match, and they match in an interesting way. It's not sort of trivial. But uh, what about the spectrum? I mean, what this tells you is that everything in, inside the two theories will organize themselves in representations of these algebras. So then if you want to check that they're really the same, what you have to check is that the multiplicities with which the various representations appear agree. So what you find is that the higher spin fields just correspond to the vacuum representation of the W algebra. So one way of doing this is to calculate the partition function on thermal ADS3, so you put it as a temperature so that the boundary cylinder becomes a boundary torus. And then the partition function at finite temperature should correspond to the usual partition function, a cylinder, the torus partition function of the 2D CFT. So you can do this for the massless spin S fields. For a single massless spin S field, that's the answer. And then when you put all the massless spin S fields together, you get uh, this formula, which incidentally is very closely related to the McMoen function. And what you then, if you think of it in terms of a CFT, that's precisely the, the character of, a vacu of the vacuum representation of the W infinity algebra in the Tuft limit where all the null vectors have gone off to infinity. And this is just basically the Verma module character of the, of the W infinity algebra. Now, in the Tuft limit, you can do what you want. But if you think of this doing this at finite n and k, this is not a consistent CFT because the, you know that the... Um, well, you know it's not moduli invariant because the full CFT also has other representations. The representations of the full CFT are labeled by triplets of representations of SUN level K, SUN level 1, and SUN level K plus 1 with some compatibility constraint uh, and so on. So at the end of the day, it's labeled by two pairs of highest weights, one for SUN level K and one for SUN level K plus 1. And the simplest representation that generate all of these, uh, all of these uh, minimal model representations upon taking fusion are sort of the things where you take one of them to be trivial and the other one to be the fundamental or the anti-fundamental. And when you work out their conformal dimensions in the Tuft limit, and this is, a, uh, this is given by this expression, a half into one plus lambda, half into one minus lambda. But if you really try to make sense of this theory at finite n, then you should ask what is the conformal dimension as for finite n as a function of large C. And because we now understand this W infinity algebra for all values of lambda and C, that's a question we can answer. And the answer is that this conformal dimension goes like a half into 1 minus n, whereas this goes like minus C over 2n squared. Now, what this suggests to you is, you see, taking C large is like the semi-classical limit. So these conformal dimensions are proportional to the central charge. So you would think of them as being sort of non-perturbative solutions. 
whereas this stays finite in this limit, and therefore you want to think of them as being the perturbative solutions. So what this suggests is that the fields associated to F0 should be related to a perturbative excitation on the ADS uh, space. And what we uh, propose is that all of these representations of this form, so all of the perturbative ones, are accounted for by adding to the higher spin theory a complex scalar field with a specific mass, namely the mass I had on the, one of the early slides. Now, it's good that it's this mass, right? It has to be this mass, because as Vasiliev showed some time ago, if you want to consistently add a scalar field to this higher spin theory, the high HS lambda theory, it has to have that mass. There isn't any freedom. Otherwise, it's not compatible with the gauge symmetry of the higher spin theory. Now, if you take this mass and you turn it into a conformal dimension, what you find is that the conformal dimension is one plus lambda. And you see, this is uh, precisely the conformal dimension uh, of this guy. If I take the, 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 the standard quantization here, and then the main evidence that this is true is that you calculate the contribution of the higher spin fields and the single real scalar field, or the, the complex scalar field with the given mass. Now, the, for, for the real scalar, that's the contrib contribution to the thermal partition function. And if you package everything together, namely the higher spin fields and the, two, the complex scalar, so that's two real scalars of the specific mass, then you get a specific power series in Q and Q bar, which you can expand out to any order. And what we've shown is that this function is exactly identical to the CFT partition function of all these representations in the Tuft limit. You see on the CFT side, you can open the yellow book and it tells you the, the, the characters for these WNK representations. You, you take mod square of them, you sum over all of them, you take the Tuft limit, you get a specific power series in Q and Q bar, and you get exactly this power series in Q and Q bar if you just sum over all of these representations. So this is really comparing two very different calculations, a sort of a, a one-loop calculation in ADS to a detailed CFT calculation. It agrees beautifully. Now, our current point of view is that the other states you should think of as being non-perturbative solutions, and there are conical defect solutions, which Alejandro Castro, Rajesh Kopakuma, Michael Goodperla, and Joris Raymakers have found that seem to match with these. So that's the uh, current proposal, but we haven't, that's harder to check because these are sort of non-perturbative solutions and you don't quite know how to calculate their contribution to the partition function. So I'll be quick here. So there are various generalizations. You can make it supersymmetric. Then you get Kazama Suzuki models that I think is also very interesting, maybe in, also in relation to string theory. You can make it into orthogonal groups. Um, you can compare three-point functions just as for ADS4. That works out the same way. There are, um, there are black hole solutions you can construct. Um, this is a, it's a bit tricky in higher spin theories, as uh, some of you know very well, because uh, there is of this large gauge symmetry. But because of this Chen Simons description, there is a sort of an elegant way of doing it, and that allows you to construct something you can argue to be black holes. And then their entropy can be matched uh, to the dual CFT. So that was, uh, there's this, so Krauss and Perlmutter constructed these black hole solutions, calculated the entropy, and then together with uh, Tom Hartman and Kevang Jin, we uh, calculated the CFT version of the entropy, and it, it agrees, and it's not just a number. Then you can switch on the chemical potential for some of the higher spin charges, and it agrees uh, with the coefficients uh, of the power series in, this, in the corresponding chemical potential, and these coefficients are not simple functions. They're very complicated ratios of polynomials in lambda, and that works out uh, beautifully. The CFT calculation is embarrassingly complicated, but uh, it does manage to reproduce the also quite hard uh, higher spin calculation. So let me conclude by saying I hope I've convinced you that there is strong evidence for such a duality between this higher spin theory in ADS3 and this larger limit of the 2D CFTs. The duality is non-supersymmetric. Um, that's uh, maybe a good thing. Um, it certainly allows for detailed precision tests um, because both sides are under very good control. Maybe you can learn something about how to construct black holes in these sorts of theories. And then I think the main challenges for the future are to, um, I think you, you should be able to prove this duality in the, in the Tuft limit. I think there should be some sort of Chern Simons type argument to do it, and I think there's a good chance that this will work. I think it'll be very interesting to study the phase structure of the partition function, i.e. whether there is a black hole, a Hawking page-like phase transition. That's something I'm currently looking at together with uh, Rajesh Kopakuma and uh, Mukund Rangamani. They're also, I'm also aware of a, 
uh, Schenker and Castro and Maloney et al. They're also trying to do the same thing, but uh, I think there's something interesting happening here. What I'm quite excited about is that the CFT gives you very concrete predictions, say, for the mass of the scalar as a function of C, as an exact function of C. And you should be able to interpret that from a gravitational point of view. So the large C behavior is sort of the quasi-classical answer, and the one over C terms should be quantum gravity corrections from the point of view of, of ADS3. And I mean, if we can't solve quantum gravity in ADS3, then we'll certainly not manage to do it in ADS4. ADS3 gravity is topological, so maybe there's a chance to sort of really do some quantum gravity loop calculation in ADS3 and reproduce this very definite prediction which the CFT gives you. It's the same for the three-point coupling of the higher spin fields. There's a very specific coefficient as a function of C, and one should be able to determine it from a sort of honest uh, gravity calculation in ADS3. And finally, obviously, it's important to embed it into string theory, and I think there are some interesting ideas coming out of the higher dimensional analog also for this lower dimensional theory. So I'll stop here. Thank you. <coughs> yes, uh, first uh, one confusion. One of your uh, conformal dimensions was 1 minus n, and it seemed to be negative at large n. That is true, yes. So That's a good point. Um, you see, what I'm doing here is I'm taking, so the, the minimal models are surely unitary. But what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm, I'm fixing n and taking c large. And when you take these wn models and you take c large, then I think they become non-unitary. So this is a, precisely a sign of this, that they become non-unitary. But our belief is that for the purposes of identifying which ones you should, you should think of as being the perturbative and which ones you should think of as being the non-perturbative solutions, you may not have to worry about the fact that a theory becomes non-unitary. But you're, you're absolutely right that in this limit, fixing n and taking c large, the minimum, this wn theories become non-unitary. This is different to Virasoro. In Virasoro, you see c can be as large as you like. But mm. already for w3, I think if you make c too large, the theory becomes non-unitary. Uh, so the, by minimal, you mean minimal wn models? Yeah. Yes. yeah. Um, so this takes care of one question because um, uh, I think that Maloney and collaborate and Castro uh, and, and others have computed partition functions of pure gravity, and they wanted to identify them with uh, minimal models when c is less than yeah. one. But those are very uh, Last question: uh, WNs can be obtained by Hamiltonian reductions of SLN. Right? Yes. And uh, so, is there any relation with the SLN chern simons Absolutely. Uh, I mean, this is basically the calculation of Campoleoni et al. That's uh, you see when you. I mean, when you, when you describe uh, gravity or these higher spin theories as trans-simon theories, all the fun is in the boundary conditions, right? You have to be very careful how to pick the boundary conditions so that, because everything is topological, so you have to be very careful. And the correct boundary condition from the point of view of the 2D CFT is precisely Hamiltonian reduction. So that's in a sense how you understand why WN appears as the dual symmetry for the SLN trans simons theory. You were talking about uh, these two sets of representations, right? Mm -hmm. In the second set of representations, these ones that do correspond to non-perturbative states, uh, you were saying that they were like, uh, right, uh, it seemed to me that they were like black holes. Were you, were you saying that? Sort of. I mean, they're not quite black holes. I mean, their conformal dimension goes like C, so they should be like, so what they are, they are sort of uh, solutions where, the, where there are holonomies, non-trivial holonomies for the gauge field, but they're not black hole-like in the sense that it's along a thermal circuit rather than a I mean, you have, whether it's a black hole or a conical singularity is a question of whether the singularity is along the space-like circle or the time-like circle of your ADS space. So these are like black hole solutions, except they have the singularity in the other direction. And normally, you would think of these solutions as being singular. But in this higher spin game, they don't seem to be singular because there seems to be a good gauge choice in which they seem to be regular. So that's the, that's, that's the, the origin of these, of these sort of additional... Uh, of these coni sorry of these conical defect solutions, so they are they are sort of like uh, coni conical deficit solutions, but that would you normally discard because of singularities, but because of this higher spin symmetry, they seem to be as good solutions as any others.
My question is similar to the one I asked you, I think, more than a year ago at yes. CERN. I still don't uh, know the answer. In 2005, <laughs> we introduced this non-critical M theory uh, defined in terms of uh, non-relativistic Fermi liquids in a double scaling limit. And what we found in the analog of the tensionless limit was precisely the Vassiliev 2 plus 1 dimensional theory with matter, but on ADS2 cross S1. Does that suggest that there is more of a triality, with that being the third leg and the minimal models and the um, Vassilia theory being the two other legs. Have you thought about this? Since I have. Well, I mean, I, I thought a little bit about it, but I haven't managed to. I can't say anything intelligent about it. So I think that was the first first uh, derivation of that type of Vassilia uh, mm -hmm. theory from some other system. So I mm -hmm. would want to know if there is a connection. Uh, and yeah, so it's All right. I should turn. It's just a curiosity, in the old time of, uh, when W minimal models were studied, there was also attempts to use them as local theory, like W gravity. And uh, does this, could this have to do anything with the quantum gravity of AD? You mean with the stringy generalization? Yes. Maybe. I'm, uh, the way I'm thinking about it, probably not. But at the moment, I'm thinking about it, probably not. But um, yeah, I, I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> 